and ports. We talk about um, um, a market of uh, 500 millions of populations, so which which is quite large, I guess. Um, but to serve this uh, area of consumption and, and production, we have only 20 commercial <laughs> ports dealing with uh, international flows, which is not so much uh, compared with the uh, western part of Africa, for instance. And uh, we have some, of course, uh, big stars like Djibouti as a as a really a strategic hub in the in the north, and we have a port like uh, like Durban, which have been uh, as uh, Tanger Med or Port Said, one of the big uh, hub uh, serving east and west part of Africa. So, um, more or less in 2019, uh, 10 million of TUs has been handled in, into the area, which is a lot, uh, I guess. And um, we can say that um, just to give you other figures, uh, I would I would share because it's important uh, to. to to have a broad view about uh, what we are talking about today. Uh, 60, uh, 70 percent of the total flows are on the import uh, uh, side and only 30 percent on the export. So we have a trade imbalance which impacts as well uh, the performance sometimes of the of the regional economy. And uh, what is amazing, it struck me a little bit, it's that uh, almost 65% uh, of the total uh, capacity deployed on the area is controlled by only two companies, Verse Client on one hand and uh, MSC on the other hand. And both are uh, working together into the strategic alliance to HAM to, to connect Asia to Europe. So. It's, it's as well something I would like to discuss with our panelists about uh, this concentration of activities and, and the strategic uh, assets, uh, especially on that harsh times we are living now with the scarcity to find a container with the super high freight rates and uh, some blank selling strategy, which impacts really some, uh, some ports actually. And uh, finally, a uh, final word to, to say that um, um, on a macroeconomic perspective, the Eastern and Southern Africa deal uh, especially with uh, uh, Far East for 46 person and Middle East for 27 person. So it means that uh, Europe and Mediterranean uh, weight at least uh, only 20 person of the total volume connected uh, to Eastern and Southern Africa. This is, the, this is the key figures I would like just to share with uh, first maybe the Colonel André Ciseau because you are the, the Secretary General of the Regional uh, Association of Ports, um, gathering all the, the port authorities from uh, Djibouti to uh, Walbis Bay, I would say, including the Indian Ocean. Am I, am I right, André? Yes, you are very right, yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, André. And uh, I know that you are perfectly bilingual because uh, you are lucky enough to be a Mauritian guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> merci encore d'être avec nous. Um, concerning my, my, my figures, do you have any, any comments? Or, um, do, do you have any uh, reaction co concerning the development, the recent development and the, of the, the, the PAMESA activities and the what, what is going on actually in terms of uh, port development, port competition uh, on that uh, very stimulated uh, range from Djibouti to Walvis Bay? Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, you are very right, Jan. But I would like also to point out that uh, the region is one of the fastest growing in the world at the moment and has a growing population as well. Ports need to be able to keep up with pace of change being experienced around the world. From the tip of ICT, gender sensitiveness and embracing multimodalism. However, there is a poor joint planning and joint investment in the region. That is one of the important challenges that we need to tackle. Projects are hap haphazard and not looked at as long-term initiatives. So uh, this is what is happening in the region. There's the need to uh, bring uh, the governments together, the people in the region together to work together so that we can develop long-term vision and not look at our only our local business model for our ports without understanding what is going on in the global market when it comes to transportation of goods between our uh, 
uh, import market and the market that we're exporting to. And the, the vessels that is coming into play right now, the weight will challenge the infrastructure development in the eastern and southern region. Like you rightly pointed out, the two main important port in the region with the, the characteristics that match the new uh, vessels fleet that is coming into play is Djibouti and Durban. So uh, we note that uh, many uh, African countries in the east and the south, they are trying to become a hub. At the same time, maybe sometimes they overlook the future of size of vessels that is coming into the region. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Colonel. Um, you know, uh, we have seen uh, the first January of 2021, the, 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 the national, no, no, the Continental Free Trade Zone Agreement coming into force. Um, I guess it's uh, historical. And, and what does it mean for Pamesa ports? Are, are ports really, uh, I would say, prepared to uh, develop some uh, trade facilitation services between two ports uh, competing, but now tomorrow maybe with the collaborating more than compete together? What's your feeling about that? Is, is, is that agreement another one, politically speaking, or is that really a a game changer in terms of logistics and, uh, and trading flows uh, across border without any too, too many problems uh, in terms of, you know, um, paperless systems and so on and job connectivity between uh, uh, single windows and, and so on. What's your, what's your feeling about that? In fact, uh, this is another challenge that the region is facing. That is because of poor regional cooperation when it comes to infrastructure development, nationalistic tendency, like I mentioned earlier, or silo mentality, uh, the order of the day, and the spirit of regional cooperation has overtones of political overtures, political patronage, we call it, and border points are crucial nodes in the value chain. Therefore, inefficient border point casts a negative shade on the port efficiency. Border crossing procedures are duplicated on each side of the border. High and varied shipping tariffs and charges within member states due to fragmented sector regulations and policies. Lack of investment in soft initiatives, that is ICT, like you pointed out, training, harmonization of policy review as well. The moderate uptake of data-driven initiatives for smart decision. Example, lack of consensus, consensus on port performance indicators, making it difficult to identify competitive ports. The sector is also largely gender biased in our region. Okay, and, and Colonel Ciso, you know, a couple of years ago, I've been invited in Zambia. That was an amazing seminar about, uh, and my, pro my proposal was how to turn the landlocked constraint into the land-linked opportunities in the southern part of Africa. Uh, how do you consider, you know, the, the fact that, for instance, actually, I, we know that we have some little bit problems, say, I guess, in, in Mozambique, how the, the, the South African ports make, a, I would say, a, a, a role, you know, into connecting these those uh, landlocked countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe, and so on. Um, how is, you know, how the ports can invest into some uh, solutions to interlinked, uh, uh, not only through corridors, but I guess uh, by investing some uh, funds into uh, dry ports or into logistics platform. Is that the role of a port authority tomorrow to do that? Uh, we are seeing that now ports are also undertaking other projects like uh, Green Port Initiative, which is an environment initiative, renewable energy, development of other infrastructure that, of course, it links to the port. But is it the real mandate of the port to uh, sort of uh, divert the attention on the traditional jobs? to go into the development of corridors and access. Of course, they are very important. And the development of uh, dry ports that we have a few in Africa, they are coming up slowly. But the problem with our countries in Africa is the challenges of funding the infrastructure. We most of the time see that the funding come from outside Africa. 
to invest in the infrastructure and the repayment is so difficult that it becomes a challenge into event trading across the border. But like you point out, Zambia is a country that is linked to, is locked between eight different countries. And it is very important for Zambia to develop the corridors in collaboration with the partners on the coast so that the exports as well as the import can flow effectively. But the rail system, the, uh, the waterways system also is not that developed. These are areas that uh, I think we, we need to look at to see how best we can use the waterways. And uh, we, I'm sure it will be less costly than trucks and rails to uh, transport goods in terms of volumes also and transportation costs when it comes to the uh, uh, waterways as well. And the dry ports also to be developed effectively. This is a challenge, and I believe that there is a need to synergize by the, all the African countries and the ports to be able to develop this infrastructure within Africa by Africans so that we can derive maximum benefits with our export also. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, I've, I've committed a couple of papers um, over the last months about the fact that uh, this um, really historical um, uh, continental free trade zone area in Africa, you got a missing link. Uh, you, they didn't even talk about how to promote short sea shipping and how to develop some shipping connectivity for releasing some issues co on, of connection, of trade facilitation. And I thought that it's a really a, a, an historical mistake as well to not include the ports as well as the shipping lines and the shipping services into the, the tools, you know, the fundamental tools to support the intra-African trade and to use the ports as key uh, strategic, uh, uh, I would say, asset for sustaining a, such a vision of integration into Africa. I do believe, and I fully agree with you, that we have to focus on and we have to support the development of shipping lines <coughs> and inside Africa and to connect countries of Africa all together. If I can add on, uh, PAMESA is routing to be established. PAMESA is rooting for establishment of a national or regional shipping lines to be established. I'm sure that major alliance would not take it kindly to this posture. However, as we are all aware, disruption somewhere along the line will be realized or being realized currently. If you remember when we had the piracy problem, there were less ships calling to the region and they were panicked by especially the island states on the east coast of Africa because ships were not calling and food stuff were not coming into the region. Even the exports also were challenged because of the maritime security problem. And at that time we analyzed with the Indian Ocean Commission region islands, if we had our own shipping lines, it would have been very helpful to us because we'd have our own security personnel on board and manage it amongst ourselves. But uh, it had been very difficult because of uh, challenges like we don't have uh, economy of scale. And initially we thought that by working with uh, the coast of African mainland, it would help the islands to be able to trade across the border, which we are talking a lot today. So establish the shipping lines like Ethiopia and newly established the shipping line like Djibouti shows the region that it is not impossible to undertake given the right market conditions. But of course, the market will be challenged by the big shipping lines, which had traditionally been, uh, until today anyway, controlling the region when it comes to import and exports of goods. However, member states need to get their policies in line. I will give you some observations. Maritime cabotage, like we call it, services, are generally excluded from trade liberalization commitments. Cabotage restrictions remain in place in applied regimes in the form of conditions that need to be met by foreign vessels in order to be able to provide maritime transport services between two ports within the same country. The restrictive nature of maritime cabotage registration, registration regime 
chases away the private sector involvement until today. We need what needs to happen to begin realizing cabotage business is harmonized regulations and policies amongst the members, a need to review of existing cabotage laws in the coastal states to create harmonized regional cabotage policy. Members should also have a mechanism that reviews the impact on international conventions and charges for uniform decision on ratification or not to ratify. So you see, uh, if we are able to work together, it will happen as long as we remain fragmented and does not have the power ourselves to determine the future when it comes to the cabotage or short shipping, we will remain uh, just uh, like we are today. But we know that a country like Ethiopia is doing quite well because they have their own fleet of cargo vessels, which uh, do the import and export dedicated for Ethiopia. These are very good example that other countries can adopt. But of course, we need to work out with private sector initiative as well to ensure that there's the drive, the management capacity, and the funding to sustain the strategy. Thank you very much, Colonel. Um, you, you, you point out many, many, um, so I would say, fundamental and vital aspects and components of the development of the cabotage and the, as well the, the need, the, the, the mandatory need, I would say, to. Uh, to have a common view uh, for serving common goals. And actually, of course, you said, uh, and you, you remind that uh, a fragmented view of the area uh, from Eastern to Southern uh, market, like the one we are talking about, half a billion of population served by the ports. They need to have a common view. And uh, I, I do believe that Pameza is doing a wonderful job to, to gather the, the, the part of you from a small, to a big port from a dedicated regional activities to a super large hub. And I, I really would like to congratulate yourself and to congratulate the, the, the regional associations for doing a, such a job for put that into the minds of the people who decide and we create some um, policies and uh, try to have, a, a, I would say, a harmonized view for developing such uh, networks, especially with that we need to look at the Interland, but we need as well to look at the foreland uh, strategy. And I guess uh, you brought out many, many uh, important things. And I would like to thank you for that. And I, I would go to South Africa now, if you don't mind. I, I would travel from Mauritius. Uh, are you, I, no, you are touch base in Kenya, am I right? Yes, I'm based in Kenya. Okay, so I go. I flew from Kenya to, to Durban, a wonderful city, when I really love to to see on the really early in the morning, the surfer uh, at the end of the case, that the wonderful there. Uh, hello, Moshe, how are you today? I'm great, thanks, and how are you? Uh, I'm very happy and very proud to have, uh, to have you with us today. And um, I just remind that you are the general director of the Port of Durban, and uh, you are, of course, by the way, part of the Transnet uh, uh, National Network of Ports in, in South Africa. As I said at the beginning, Durban has been for a long time the biggest port of Africa by playing that fundamental roles of connecting um, the, I would say, Africa, uh, separate, uh, I would say, sub-Saharan African markets uh, by playing the role of hub from the east to the west as well to connect to the Indian Ocean and, uh, and, and to Asia. Actually, uh, I would like to have your, your, your feeling or your point of view about uh, the impact of the situation today. Uh, are you affected by um, that amazing time we are living now, we are experiencing now with uh, the multiplication by four or five of the price of the container, the, the lack of availability of empties for exporting cargoes from Africa to the rest of the world, and obviously some blank selling strategy which uh, might uh, skip some ports in Africa, and especially maybe not, this is not maybe the case of Durban that you would confirm, but uh, how do you react and uh, what are, I would say, the, the, the solutions you are dealing, you are trying to implement today for facing a such challenge? Thank you. Look, uh, let me start by saying we are not immune to these challenges. We 
also are affected. I mean, we every day, what we have uh, started doing just for us to be on top of the situation at a practical level is to have all the container ports that we have in the country having an hours meeting every day with shipping lines and clearing and forwarding agents uh, together with the rail colleagues. Uh, the purpose of this really is to make sure that everybody understands what is the situation like on the ground in terms of uh, the container movements and placement, the availability of capacity and the bottlenecks that might arise. And we try and get everyone to go in the same space. We then have been hit hard by COVID like most of the economies. I mean, yesterday, again, further restrictions uh, were, were imposed on South African uh, like community based to the surge of the third wave uh, in terms of COVID. Whoops. We have lost, I guess, unfortunately, um, Moshe, can you hear me again or not? I don't know if someone is hearing me now. Ah, Moshe is coming back. Uda, are you around? Okay, Moshe is coming back. Yeah, yeah, you're on mute. You're on mute, Moshe, please. Can you just activate your mic, please? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, you are back again. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry I that. don't know what happened. Yes. Uh, I was saying then there are further restrictions that have been put on uh, on the movement of people in general, but uh, we know there are sectors that are going to be reacting or being impacted negatively by those which subsequently end up impacting on the port. Your hospitality, we know when it comes to the cruise, uh, Devon is one of the cruise uh, uh, ports uh, in the continent, one of the biggest, and we, uh, it has been closed uh, since last year. And also some industries that are importing goods that are required in the hospitality industries are being affected by this. We have though said, let's look at uh, saying, how do we take this lull time where the volumes are low to prepare us for the recovery that is surely certainly going to follow this. We have uh, decided as the port of Deben to relook at repurposing some of the sections within the port. There were areas where some cargoes were on the decline. We want to repurpose those and uh, set them aside for containers. We're doing this because we have made the same observation as the colonel was making here that if we do not increase the rate of the ships arriving, in the country, the rest of the region gets affected. We know that uh, there are many countries that are dependent on us, and we really want to prepare Deben to be that platform that will also open opportunity for cabotage vessels that would want to run between Deben and other ports within the region, not only in South Africa, but in the neighboring states, and then say, let us have uh, some big ships coming in because we already have the interest structure with dealing with the bed deepening and then allow for the, the regional uh, countries to use the, the port of Deben to increase their connectivity with the rest of the world. Secondly, we also have been making observations around the Africa free trade, uh, the, this uh, continental agreement saying that in as much as uh, it, it's got these uh, beautiful ideals, most of them are not short term. If you're looking at uh, the issues between the countries, the Canada was talking to them, uh, where you've got separate regimes, even when it comes to goods crossing from one country to the next country. This is becoming a cost in the logistics uh, chain. It, it wouldn't assist to have a, a well-functioning port if the goods that have to go to the next country are going to be uh, held back. It then makes that port to be inefficient because ultimately the destination will be saying the good that come from port X is not arriving on time. So we really are engaging politicians to say, can practical things be put in place to make sure that we've got the, those borders open 24 seven and also introduce a single window thing where we'll take out most of this administrative stuff that slows down the ease of moving of goods within the region. We also have seen that within ourselves, there is a, if you like, shortage of skills the way we need to improve in terms of saying, how then do you 
create capacity of skill that is going to enable the port to respond in the current challenges that are meant to ignite the entire region. And we have to tap to other countries that we're working with and then begin to understand what is the skill base we have. What can we do with that skill base to enable the, the port and the entire chain to work well? And we're working with institutions of higher learning here where we have started looking at new streams that are or, or problems that are being researched by the, the, the schools here in the port of Deben, we've looked at the land side congestion and say there are sections of the port where you've got about 14 different operators. They all are working from different operating systems. And as a result, when they come to the port, the issue of coordinating and smooth running of that prison becomes a problem. We're working with the institutions of higher learning to develop a solution that is going to be common user, but not giving away the, the, the competitive uh, advantage of the various players because they do compete, but we're wanting to select the information that will be of common interest. We also have looked at the, <clears throat> besides that, we then say, what do we need to do on the infrastructure? We might not have money. Uh, the Kennel was talking around funding. We have for the first time now decided to say we will open up the space in container terminals where we are going to invite private operators to come and uh, compete with the state owned uh, terminal operator that is here. We are not privatizing that one, but like I was talking around repurposing of this area, we are going to open uh, and attracting new investors to come in. And we hope that it's gonna bring in much needed money in terms of investment and bring in new set of skills and to influence the culture in terms of doing things differently so that the customers themselves can also not feel that they are being hamstrung by one terminal operator. And we have uh, launched what we call the Deben Hub Master Plan, which is looking at what we need between now and 2032, where we're looking at increasing the capacity from where we're sitting with uh, 2.9 million TUs. We want to go just uh, above 11 million by 2032 because we have looked that the region is growing and we need to create that opportunity for them. We have engaged the customers and we have noted, uh, you were asking earlier around a few players that are dominating MSC and MESC. We have met all shipping line, including them and, and said, we want to partner with them in terms of selling this new destination and also to make sure that they work with, uh, within the legal framework of the country to ensure that the opportunities that are going to accrue are going to really be felt by the intended recipient because it does not help if everything else will be imported and then the locals will not feel anything. We want them to be part of that uh, participation. So th th that's what we're doing. We have identified that uh, the inefficiencies in the port network adds another 30% on the cost of exporting goods. And we are now working towards reducing that and monitoring if that number does change. And we have identified eight areas of focus where we are going to change the issues around the, the, the inefficiencies. If I were to run quickly through those eight areas, one was to say the Port Authority alone cannot change this. It needs to have a multi-party uh, roundtable conversation where we have called everyone from government to, like I was saying, institution of higher learning, police, shipping lines, clearing and forwarding, tracking fraternity, rail partners, where we sit and say, how can we identify problems and we co-own them and release them. The second one is to look at the performance of individual terminals because as an authority, we are not handling cargo, but we are overseeing those who are handling cargo. We have looked at key areas where we should focus at and get reports that are going to give us a sense of whether the terminal operator is performing in line with the commitments that have been made. We, we, we're looking at that and we, we're tracking that on bi-weekly basis where we get this information. Thirdly, we have also looked at uh, working very close with the municipality, which has been a problem because in cases such as ours where the city does not have a stake in the port, at times they do not see the port as a partner more than as a nuisance that attracts the, the, the trucks. But we have now got into a sweet spot with the city where they have deployed police that are dedicated to the port, traffic police uh, who are making sure that everyone who comes to the port adheres to the traffic management rules. 
We also have seen that the drivers themselves, because it's a mix of drivers, they are local drivers, they are drivers from neighboring countries. Some are not familiar with how they need to carry themselves around the port. We have developed a drug driver induction program where we are training them on what they need to do so that we minimize the point of conflict between them and the law enforcement agents. We have also looked at the infrastructure, the fifth area, the road networks that links the port, because we saw that if we do not increase that uh, road with the projected increase, we are still going to have a problem. And we note that the strength of this supply chain will depend on its weakest link. In this case, it will be the congestion towards the city or the congestion at the border with the uh, neighboring countries. Those are the areas where we're focusing on and say, what do we need to do to overcome that? In the port with the municipality, we've just launched a, a program of spending 3 billion brands in, in, in building a new second access road to the port that will link the logistic park that is outside of the port, about six kilometers from the port, at the back of the port area, with the current port, and we're building a new road that is going to be co-funded. We feel that is a, a way to go, and everyone is excited about it, and we are co-funding this. The sixth area really is to constantly keep this information flowing, where we having a, a, a communication team who's task is to make sure that the feedback from this engagement is felt throughout the country. We issue a, a quarterly executive summary of what's happening every week. I pen down a, a weekly bulletin where I just give people updates on the eight areas. The last one really is to look at saying the industry itself has not migrated as fast as we would love it to where we're realizing that there's few uh, facilities that work 24 7 and that does cause congestion where people do not know uh, where to take the containers to on saturdays public holidays and at night we're working with few of them where we even looking at uh, incentivizing them uh, by opening 24 7 but we then say this should not be a cost to us if we can either we are exploring putting a, a surcharge if you like for the boxes that are not uh, collected within uh, or are not nominated uh, before the vessel beds so that the transporter can take it those who have not done that we, will be penalized we keep this money and give it to the depot that will open 24 7. We hope that once we do that, it's going to be self-correcting because once people begin to realize that there's a cost associated with them not immediately releasing cargo for collection, they will then uh, do that. If they do that, the depot will then have a demand of somebody wanting to drop container 24-7, and we hope that it's going to bring about the improvement. We, we have seen tremendous uh, improvement from where we were in terms of problems. That's why we are sitting at this but the biggest thing really that we are doing is this master plan, which has got impact on the other neighboring ports within South African network. There are cargoes that we will relocate from Deben to the port of Richest Bay. In the main mineral handling, we want Deben to remain a clean port and have Richest Bay to be an industrial port that will handle all the mineral export and the petrochemical products. Whoa, thank you very much, Moshe. I guess I have a lot of things. I heard many, many so uh, fruitful uh, information coming from, from South Africa, thanks to you. Thank, thank you very much. As I understood, but maybe I'm wrong, but Transnet uh, appears um, as almost unique, you know, um, in, in Africa because um, you are still operating port lending activities, pure lending activities, but on the same time, you keep investing um, massive public funds on the national transportation uh, network, uh, especially the, the roads and so on. So, um, you know, um, how, how do you see the role of Transnet in the forthcoming years based on the fact that some companies like CMS, EGM, because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I've been invited in a really stimulated uh, seminars uh, powered by Seva Logistics. And the CEO of Seva Logistics, Mathieu Friedberg, explained that uh, in some countries like Nigeria or South Africa, he has a um, very, very aggressive program of development by connecting the, the opportunities proposed by CMS EGM on one hand on the, on the shipping line activities 
connecting to the inlands by offering door-to-door uh, -door services, 100% controlled by the same uh, group of company under the umbrella of, of CMS CGM. Is that, um, is, is that a good point for you? Is that a threat? Is that uh, a new challenge for the coming year for Transnet? How do you expect from that kind of strategy of integration, vertical integration, especially on that time, so on, uh, shipping lines are really, really profitable, so they want to invest on the inland and they want to invest in products and practices, and it might create some uh, distortion or maybe some new competitive competition between countries or between terminals on, or ports. So what, what is your feeling about that? Look, I, I think it is a welcome intervention. We, we, we understand that there are things that uh, only us are currently doing at this point in time due to the, 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 the framework that we have. For example, we are the ones that are running trains. But even on that front, we, we're looking at uh, opening up opportunities for Transnet to partner with other private players who are interested in, in, in rail facilities. So we know if we do that, the, the preoccupation here is to get South Africa going and the countries around here. If somebody else, a private sector, is coming to help the country to do better, we'll welcome that. And uh, we, in fact, when there are people offering similar service to us, it then will get us to, to move, to realize that we are not the only ones in here. And we see ourselves uh, working and collaborating with some of those players at the ports. The ports authority is going to always be owned by the state and be working with them. But in terms of using of our trains, again, there's an opportunity where we partner, where we get something instead of stifling the economy. We need to release that uh, to somebody who, who can work with us. So we, we are open in terms of engaging with those uh, where we have a, a framework of the public sector, uh, private participation where we, we look at various options where we can allow them. We are working with World Bank right now to identify opportunities across from the ports to rail and say, which areas can we immediately start with where we calling for these partners to come and work? Thank you very much, Moshe. And um, I, I, would, I would just conclude uh, our change by just a, a remark, you know, um, since a couple of years now, I think that I, that's my point of view. I don't know if I'm right or not. And I would have the, the, the point of view of mine concerning my, my, my statement. But I would say that from a port competition or a terminal competition, we have now to deal with corridor competition. We've seen the Walvis Bay Corridor Initiative uh, on the east path. We've seen the Nakala Corridor on the other hand. And um, it, it might as well be uh, uh, another uh, regional level of competition which raised now and uh, I guess the good point is that uh, creating more competition means that we will have some uh, I guess uh, more performative uh, systems of transportation and it would good be good at the end of the, the, the you know the the road for the consumers um, just just your feeling about that how the urban or other ports of South Africa is considering the new competition coming from east and west, through those new corridors, uh, which are not quite new now, but they are now under uh, under deployment, and uh, it might change the way of dealing with the competition between ports. Am I right? Yes. In fact, we welcome this. This is long overdue. We we, we must uh, know that Africa. We have to think beyond our own borders. What is best for the region must happen. If it has to happen to a neighboring country, let that be. We should not hold back uh, our energies in making sure that that succeeds. We know for, for now that most of SADC region is dependent on South African ports to, to network. I mean, countries like you mentioned in Zambia, we've got also DRC. There's a corridor that runs from Devon to DRC. And DRC has got an additional eight other corridors. And we want to make this corridor to work because if it works, it means that we are able to also lower the cost of doing business in our own country. And for the Africa Free Trade Agreement to happen, we need to get these regions, all of them working. Because even the goods from South Africa, if we are starting to open up these corridors, it's just going to assist not only the, 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 the water side corridors, but the land side corridors are very important for us as a region to, to lower the cost of living and to 
to it, I mean, the, the, the cost of doing business and improve the cost of living for, for the people in the region is something that we have to do. Two weeks ago, I was in Zambia. I mean, I was uh, asking the guys at the Victoria Falls, uh, just cruising in there, saying, is there a thought of having a waterway that links Livingston with the other towns upstream? Because I, I thought seeing the trucks and say, yeah, you've got a big river, maybe like the Kennel was saying, it's something that we have to look at and say, can we not start putting more money in terms of dredging those rivers, uh, move stones and, and at least uh, optimize on it because that river alone, it touches Zimbabwe, it touches Zambia and Botswana and Angola. So you've got four countries that can be accessed maybe from one area where you, you, you can really improve the, the, the way of doing uh, of, of movement of cargo. Thank you very much. I really appreciate um, your, I would say, you, 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 open, you open your heart and you give us a really, a really fruitful information and, and insight about the, the African port development and as well, I would say, the African transportation systems to serve the, the regional area. And uh, Maina, would you mind, uh, um, I'm really pleased to have you because uh, I've heard many, many stories about the, the laps at corridors and uh, uh, who, are, who are behind that initiative, uh, what will be the, what will be really the, the, I would say the objective of the laps at corridors uh, to connect South uh, Sudan, uh, to connect Ethiopia, uh, what does it mean as well for the Kenyan authorities and the, the Tanzanian authorities? So you would have to, to answer to all of my questions and the stories I've heard about Lapset because uh, I'm really, really happy to have you with us today. And uh, uh, if you don't mind, in a couple of minutes, would you mind sum up a little bit, uh, what is Lapset? Um, what is going on now today on Lapset corridors? Uh, and um, and uh, what would be next, I would say, considering, as I said in the introduction, uh, some new initiatives from Barbera, for instance, and, uh, and the Chinese investment, uh, which have rehabilitated the, the, the corridors between uh, Addis Abeba and, and Djibouti. So I guess uh, we have a really stimulated uh, market now with more than 100 millions of population in Ethiopia on the really, really positive uh, economic development. So. So the floor is yours because I would talk about Lapset without knowing so much about it. So take it easy thank and you. Uh, thank you very much for being us. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yan. And first of all, allow me to thank you even for inviting us uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, I really appreciate it. Having said that, let me try to answer your many questions because there are many. But I'll just start by saying that uh, Lapset starts for Lamport, Southern Sudan, Ethiopia Transport Corridor. And when you hear that, then uh, actually, this is a program which is being done by uh, three footprint countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Southern Sudan. Allow me also to give you the components of uh, this program. We have the land port, which is the anchor project of uh, this program. And then we have uh, the highways uh, connecting uh, Lamu, uh, Addis Ababa through a town called Isiolo, and also Lamu, Isiolo to uh, Southern Sudan, Cuba. There, we also have the other component of uh, pipelines, two of them, the crude uh, oil pipeline, we should move from uh, Southern Sudan uh, through Northern Kenya and then to Lamu. And then uh, from Lamu, we also expect uh, we also expect now a pipeline for product, uh, oil products from Lamu again to Addis Ababa. We also expect to have uh, the other component of uh, an SGR railway, again from Lamu uh, to Isiolo, then branching to Addis Ababa through a town known as Moyale, and the other branch again to uh, Southern Sudan, 
through Trocana. We also have a component of uh, what we call resort cities. These are mainly for tourism. There are three of them, one in Lamu, another one in Isiolo, and uh, the third one in Trocana. And we also have uh, in the same program, in the same project, we have also planned for three international airports, one in Ilamu, another one in Isiolo, and another one in Trocana. And then for provision of uh, utilities, and this is water, electricity, and maybe food uh, along that corridor, there's also the plan to have uh, a dam. We are calling it the High Glad Falls, which will provide for electricity, it will provide for water, it will provide for tourism, and then uh, uh, an agricultural product uh, project, which will be very useful in uh, feeding the people of that area. So in a nutshell, that's what we call a, a lab set. Thank you. What, what is impressive in, in, in your presentation um, is the fact that LabSet is by far uh, much more than just a logistics corridor. It's, it's, a, it's a really a sub-regional planning project uh, uh, involving so many uh, um, uh, components, I would say. And, um, but if, if I just would like to focus a little bit about logistics, is there any program of developing some dry ports on the and activities, you know, to add some value added to, I don't know, Ethiopian exportation products, or, for instance? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ian, once again. Yes, there is a uh, plans to have a dry port. And the first one, the first dry port will be in Moyale, which should be very important for our goods moving to Addis Ababa or to Ethiopia, and also goods moving from Ethiopia to uh, for export. When you talk of uh, maybe other aspects of uh, uh, this corridor, which will uh, bring in some economic benefits, as Lab said, we have taken it upon ourselves uh, to come up with a master plan for the area with, okay, to start with the corridor is contained of an area of 500 meters, but you are doing a plan on either side of the corridor, 50 kilometers outside the corridor. And the purpose of this plan is now to come up with uh, economic facilities or investments, which will be feeding in the corridor. When you look at the area we are talking about, Actually, it's an area we are opening because for us, it has been a closed area, both in Kenya and also maybe uh, Southern Ethiopia. But even as much as it has been closed, it's very key in, uh, for example, livestock production. It's also very key when it comes to tourism. There are a number of uh, minerals in this area which uh, can be accessed now through the corridor. So the plan is, as we develop the corridor, we are also uh, developing some industries, some amber tours, some food processing industries. We are coming up with conservancies in these areas. And all these are meant to feed in the corridor, so that, uh, it fed uh, in, in products, which will either be mostly consumed uh, outside the corridor through export or otherwise. So there are a lot of plans uh, within this corridor so that it will open up this area which has been closed for quite some time. Thank you. Uh, I, I would have maybe another question about the port of Lamu. You know, after a couple of years of delay, we have um, inaugurated, um, I would say, the first operational activities of Lamu. According to your experience on, on is Lamu um, a, a real game changer by, uh, I would say, creating his own market share? Or is that, is that just, a, you know, um, uh, I would say, to reduce the gap between the, 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 the supply and the demand uh, on the regional area? Because we know that the port of Mombasa or the port of Dar es Salaam are really fully congested for a long time now. We have some 
problem of dwell times and so on. So is Lamu, uh, you know, a new competitor or, um, or something needed for, for the regional economy because we lack some uh, commercial ports, according to you? Uh, Lamu port, as it is, we won't really talk of it being a, a competitor to Mobasa because we, we, uh, we, we can't even compare the two. Because if I would give us uh, some background, this port is composed, at the time it will be complete, we'll have uh, 32 baths. This will be baths of a length of about uh, 400 meters. And as we speak today, I would like to say one of the baths is already complete. The second and the third bath, we expect them to be complete by October. Actually, we are planning for the uh, commissioning of the same. And the beauty of what has already happened is that uh, all the work which has been done in this land port has been done by the government of Kenya using its resources. And why the government of Kenya has done this is because it wanted to take that risk of showing other investors that uh, uh, this is a project which can be done and it's a project which will be useful to the three print countries. Going forward, we are looking now for investors, maybe through public-private partnership or otherwise, who then come and uh, through agreements with the government, they'll be able now to do the other uh, remaining. But together with this, we have done a lot of planning in Lamu. Uh, for example, we are coming up with a special economic zone, which again will be feeding to uh, uh, to the to the Lamu of Port, uh, Lamu, uh, port, uh, port of Lamu, and this is because we don't want to make the mistake maybe which uh, happened when uh, Mobasa Port was developed. When you look at the when you look at the depth of uh, uh, the area surrounding Lamport, it has a depth of about uh, seventeen point five meters or thereabout, allowing uh, big ships to dock in that place. And actually, the idea is that uh, big ships will be coming with cargo to this port, and maybe now smaller ships will be supplying these cargoes now to the ports of Mombasa and other ports. Uh, when you look at the corridor you are talking about, as far as connectivity is concerned, it will bring con connectivity between uh, the Lapset corridor and what, what you already have in Kenya, this is the Northern corridor. Connectivity between uh, uh, the Lapset corridor and also the Central corridor in uh, Tanzania. There is also connectivity now between this corridor and um, the Trans-African Highway. And actually at the end of the day, uh, Lam Port is expected to connect with Port of Douala because there is that other bigger picture uh, of uh, enhancing the Africa continental free trade area. And uh, this is the, the, the plan we have. Thank you. So that, that, that's wonderful because, you know, Maina, you, you are talking, you are referring to the, the, the transcontinental uh, corridors. And, uh, you know, on the previous, um, on the previous webinar with um, the e-conference, uh, the general manager of the port of Djibouti, Mr. Hadi, is referring as well about the fact that uh, it's, it's the time for connecting Africa from both sides, east and west. And uh, it was referring about uh, uh, the Djibouti uh, Kribi corridors. And you are talking about the, the, the Lamu Lapset the Douala corridors. I mean that maybe we would have, um, so thanks to the African uh, free trade area agreement, maybe we would have one day the opportunity to see that corridors alive, you know, uh, really um, operational. And uh, you think that it's, it's just a dream of politician or is it, it that really uh, something which happened in a couple of maybe decades or years, I don't know, uh, 
based on the logistic needs and based on the market needs, um, what, what is the time the timeline for you uh, for, for seeing that, uh, such corridors in place? Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And as far as the timelines are concerned, actually allow me to tell you that this project has been, uh, uh, we are doing it in time. When you look at the timelines, the first bird was supposed to be led in the year 2020. That was last year. While it not for the COVID uh, uh, issues, that could have been the case. And then uh, when you look at that timeline, the second and the third bath was supposed to have been completed by the year 2021. That's where we are right, right away. And uh, this one will be completed. The other thing which will make it uh, uh, a success, as we talk now, maybe earlier on we had a problem because we didn't have a, a coordination structure within the three countries which have been uh, 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 working on this project. As we talk, this structure has been put in place. At, at the end of this month, we are going to sign a, an agreement in uh, Addis Ababa on how the three countries will be working and also on how the three countries will be uh, coordinating, uh, coordinating the project. And with that uh, joint agreement, it will now even allow us to move faster than we have been moving. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate um, your, I would say, your honesty on that project because you know sometimes it's a little bit politically sensitive uh, to to just uh, answer to my question. So I really appreciate, uh, Maina, your your point of view and uh, your insight about uh, this. I would say fundamental development for Africa. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you don't mind. I, I would cross the river to go to Madagascar. <laughs> thank you, thank and, you, Ian. Thank you, and I would I would revert to you with the the Q and A, of course. By the way, thank you so much again. Um, thank you, Captain Joy Mo. Uh, I do I don't want to scratch your name, so I would call you Captain Joy Mo if you don't mind. You are the general manager of the Agence Portuaire Maritime et Fluviale from Madagascar, as I said at the beginning, the the biggest island of the Indian Ocean, if I if I'm correct. Um, um, you know, we didn't talk so much about uh, some um, critical issues like environment, uh, um, renewable energies, and so on. We used to talk about Madagascar, uh, when we refer to Madagascar, we talk about a paradise, you know, we talk about uh, one, probably the, the most beautiful place on the earth, but uh, really sensitive, really fragile. So. As a general manager of ports and maritime and river activities in Madagascar, what is going on now in Madagascar? Uh, I know that the government is really engaged and keen to develop some uh, renewable solutions and uh, to, 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 to tackle some um, ecological uh, challenges facing uh, on your shoreline. Would you mind um, advocate a little bit about that? Uh, those, those topics we have not uh, discussing yet. Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to uh, <clears throat> to thank uh, the uh, forum to inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, uh, panel. And uh, uh, with regards to the um, environmental concerns of Madagascar. Uh, actually, uh, Madagascar's uh, environmental concerns are uh, mainly uh, uh, in two uh, aspects. First of all, uh, there is uh, deforestation, uh, which is uh, mainly uh, due to uh, bush fire, use of charcoal, uh, the traditional uh, slash, and slash and burn cultures. Uh, so that's one of the big issues here in Madagascar in terms of uh, environmental issues. The second uh, issue is on climate change uh, that affects the island uh, in uh, several uh, aspects. So when we look at this climate change, uh, 
uh, we uh, are facing a, a a drastic temperature elevation uh, around uh, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius per year, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, high. And uh, of course, uh, from the maritime side, we have a sea level rise, sea level rise around uh, seven to eight millimeters uh, per year. Uh, so, as a consequence of all of this, then uh, we have, a, if, uh, we experience now a more longer uh, dry uh, season uh, and a, a, a more shorter, uh, shorter uh, uh, rainy uh, season. As a consequence, so we have uh, we we face drought, huh? inundation, and of course during the rainy season, uh, a very uh, so, uh, intense tropical uh, cyclone. Uh, so uh, the country is uh, really uh, having a. a, a a, a big uh, issues in terms of uh, uh, coastal and inland erosion, uh, mm -hmm. impact on the uh, infrastructure during uh, tropical cyclone period. And uh, I would like to give you a few figures. Every year, we have around 300,000 people affected by the, the, the climate change issues. Uh, in terms of uh, damages and losses, uh, it's around uh, 300 millions of uh, US dollar, which is around 4% uh, of the GDP. So it's a, a, a very important issue here in uh, uh, Madagascar. In terms of, uh, if we look at the maritime uh, effects of these uh, environmental concerns, we have, uh, as I said, the coastal erosion. We experience, we begin to experience it in the western part of Madagascar, in the location uh, like uh, Murundava, and uh, in the eastern part, we started this year to have uh, the effect of sea level level rise in Swanerani uh, Vung in the eastern part near, near Saint Marie, and uh, of course uh, we are talking about ports. Uh, there are uh, some consequences in the ports as uh, we experience now a lower drop uh, in ports uh, due to. Uh, sedimentation from uh, erosion, so which uh, in, which uh, needs to be uh, addressed, and so we are facing a real need for uh, increasing the dredging dredging program in in ports in uh, uh, Madagascar. In terms of energy. Uh, uh, it's a big issue here also, energy transition. Uh, we are uh, actually having a mixed approach, meaning uh, uh, we combine thermal, uh, thermal energy and hydraulic uh, for the moment, but uh, the intention of the government is to move uh, to more and more renewable energy uh, using uh, water, uh, the sun and the winds. So we are now starting to move to uh, solar farms, etc., etc., in terms of uh, uh, energy transition. So that is uh, now the actual situation in terms of uh, environmental issues and. Uh, energy transition here in Madagascar. 
Thank you very much, Captain. I'm really impressed your experience and on on awareness uh, about those uh, uh, so important uh, topics uh, must be saluted because um, it, it's important. You know, you are you are a decision maker and uh, you know what you are talking about, and uh, I'm really impressed by that. And um, but I, I would change my, my, maybe I would I would ask to you another question, but about the port development of because you are as well uh, in charge of port development. Uh, you know, I've seen and maybe I'm wrong, but Tamatav um, uh, expect to maybe triple his uh, availability or capacity to, uh, to 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 cope with the the development and the regional development expected in the the forthcoming years by better connected uh, to the to the capital of course to to to, to, uh, to uh, Antananarivo but as well as to play maybe a major role as a new hub into the area would you mind commenting on on that and uh, why a government like Madagascar decided to really focus on the development on that uh, specific commercial ports i know that you have others program of development especially in the south for or cruising industry and so on, but um, I, I guess it's a really a cornerstone of your strategy. Am I right? Yes. Well, Madagascar is now uh, in a in a real uh, uh, change in terms of uh, maritime transport uh, uh, perspective. I uh, will begin my explanation by saying that uh, we are now working uh, on a, a ports master plan. Uh, for the whole country. Uh, as you know, we have uh, 18 ports. Uh, we have uh, seven ports uh, uh, operating uh, internationally. And uh, uh, starting last year, we are working on uh, a projection uh, up to 2045 to develop our uh, ports uh, by developing a national master plan for ports. Uh, as you say, uh, you, you, you said, uh, uh, Tuamasina is our uh, principal uh, port for, uh, for, for the moment. And uh, it has, uh, a, it is a little bit ahead uh, compared to the uh, other ports. So they developed their own uh, uh, master plan uh, uh, ahead uh, around the year of 2000 somewhere. So uh, the, the, the actual uh, plan for the Tomasina port development is uh, 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 from this year, 2021, up to 2026, with a funding around uh, 639 millions of uh, US uh, dollar of investment to extend a, a breakwater up to uh, uh, 345 in length. Uh, by the year of uh, 2023, a construction of a, a container ship uh, berthing, a new one, a new one with uh, uh, 470 meters of uh, length and uh, a, a draw uh, about 16 meters, uh, and uh, uh, an extension of the container terminal up to 10 hectares. Uh, so uh, uh, along with it is the deepening of the, 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 the former uh, container ship berthing uh, uh, up to 16 and uh, 14 meters in order to, 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 to allow the, 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 the port to receive uh, much more uh, big ships. So you are right in saying that uh, uh, Tomasina port is uh, uh, exploring the, the possibility of uh, uh, expanding their capacity to uh, uh, third times their uh, actual capacity. Uh, why is that? Uh, first of all, it's uh, because of uh, national uh, needs. 
I mean by that, uh, uh, Madagascar is in, on the way to develop its uh, uh, industries, uh, be it in mining, be it in uh, agriculture, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, in uh, manufacturing, uh, like clothing, I guess, and so on. Um, so uh, those uh, industries uh, project need a lot of uh, equipment from overseas, which uh, needs uh, a, a, a place from where they can uh, arrive. So uh, that is why uh, we are uh, uh, somehow uh, the government decided to uh, engage in this uh, uh, development of uh, Tomasina port. Uh, so, as I said, it is firstly for national uh, needs. Uh, but secondly, uh, you are right uh, to, to say that uh, uh, there is also the ambition of this port to become uh, a hub uh, for trans transshipment, especially in uh, containers in uh, container uh, in the region. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Mauritius and La Reunion is also are also developing their uh, their ports in this particular uh, area. Uh, but uh, Thomas Naport is much more bigger than uh, what they are uh, developing. And uh, as uh, we can see, it is much more uh, uh, it is much more in the, the, the not in the competition, but it's more or less, in the complementarities in these, these three ports, because the, 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 the offer, as far as the, the, the Indian, Western Indian Ocean uh, uh, is concerned, is that uh, uh, even though uh, the three countries are developing this capacity uh, in terms of uh, the container terminal, it's not yet enough uh, for the transshipment activity. If really we look at the, 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 the market of uh, container transshipment, so uh, it's more or less uh, a, a complementarity rather than a competition uh, for Mauritius Reunion and uh, Madagascar through uh, Tuomasina uh, ports. So uh, that's uh, more or less I can say uh, about the, the, the uh, port development uh, uh, which is going on in uh, Tomasina Port here in Madagascar. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate, Captain, uh, your vision. And uh, you talk about complementarity. And you know, Col Colonel Andresizo, uh, um, raised the, the concern about, you know, how we would able to develop regional cabotage and shipping development into the area. You are as well in charge of developing maritime activities for the government of Madagascar. How do you consider that uh, in, in an effective way, in an operational way? What, what is the, I would say, the opportunities and what are the, the tools or the, the, the means of the government of Madagascar for supporting such, uh, uh, I would say, national cabotage as well as uh, regional cabotage shipping activities? Yes, well, uh, this is very important uh, for Madagascar, even nationally. And uh, I think it is also a, a, a a, a big uh, topic of the Indian Ocean Commission, uh, this uh, what they call the cabotage interil, the inter island cabotage. Uh, as far as Madagascar is concerned, 
we are now working on uh, really uh, putting in place a national policy to uh, develop the, the, the uh, fleet of uh, uh, Madagascar nationally, but we ambition also to, to, to develop our fleet internationally. Uh, so as far as the, the uh, uh, inter-island cabotage, Madagascar is fully supporting this, uh, this uh, project as uh, we believe that uh, every, uh, each island in the, uh, which, is who, which is member uh, of uh, the um, Indian Ocean Commission can help each other in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, providing agricultural uh, products to the other island and uh, maybe why not uh, some uh, exchange, uh, economical um, exchange between these uh, islands so the inter-island inter cabotage will then uh, be used as a tool to link the different uh, islands. Uh, now the question is uh, really on the, on the how. Uh, of course, we need to start from the beginning. Before in the history of uh, if we look, for instance, to, to Madagascar in the history of the merchant marine, uh, here in Madagascar, we did have a, a national uh, shipping companies. Uh, now, uh, we change a bit our approach, meaning that we will not develop through uh, the government, uh, state-owned company, uh, but we uh, will work with the private sector to develop a uh, Malagasy shipping line. Okay. Uh, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, Captain, I, yes. I would just ask Colonel Andresizo his, his point of view about your statement about, you know, how to develop the the interlinking uh, services between islands, because uh, as a port manager of Mauritius, I, I do believe that he is aligned with your vision, but maybe he has something to add. C Colonel Ciso, would you react to, to the proposal of uh, uh, Captain Jean Edmond about that uh, interregional uh, uh, linking services uh, based as well on national opportunities to develop some fleet? I believe uh, the analysis that we did some years ago under the auspices of the Indian Ocean Commission, that was uh, during the time when we had that maritime security problems, we were even not only thinking of the regional cabotage in terms of having our goods landed in one of the countries in the region, but also to trade amongst ourselves. The challenges were that there were the issue of phytosanitary, for example, and also the uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, economy of scale. And that is why we thought that it would be better if we can do the Sochi shipping to also cover the Southern and Eastern African region. And now there's talk about even going up to Oman, where, which is one of the most important hub closer to us down here. There's importance for the regional cabotage to cover the East Coast of Africa and the islands. And at the same time, I think he's talking about the need for Madagascar because it's a big island and uh, they need to also transport goods along the coast all the way to the smaller, smaller town along the coast, which is maybe in line to this one, but a different uh, model as well. Thank but I think uh, there is potential for uh, the regional cabotage. Thank you very much. I do believe as well, and uh, I, I, I'm sure that you know the, the economic growth as well as the complementarity between the needs and, and you know and the and the expectation you know for having some fresh fruits and fresh agricultural product from Madagascar to the area is uh, is part of the you know of the solution as well because if you have enough demand, you are able maybe to test the the availability or 
or the, the affordability of a such service. So, uh, but I have other question on the Q and A, uh, and it's too minor because uh, it comes from Somalia. I have many people from Somalia, and uh, they. Uh, I, I would sum up maybe in one single question. They just would like Maina to know if uh, you have a, an estimation about how much it costs to transship from Lamu to other part of region. Maybe it's a little bit earlier to uh, answer to that question, but uh, from Somalia, it seems to be really important for them to use Labu as a transshipment hub to connect to other area of eastern part of Africa. Do you have any idea about uh, the cost it, it, you have to pay for transship in, in Labu? Thank you so much, uh, Jan. The way I would put it is that as, as, as per now, we might not really be having that quantifiable uh, trade which we could really talk about. Eh? But nevertheless, we know that there is a lot of trade even now taking place between uh, uh, the country of Somari and Kenya. And what we are doing and you know, what is in our plans is that as we develop the corridor, we are also doing, for example, loads which are connecting to uh, the border of uh, this country, again, as a way of welcoming them to uh, enhance our trade with us. And also so that maybe at a point, uh, this trade can be quantifiable. And mostly the, the, the trade is on livestock and also on some agricultural products, especially in the northern part of uh, the country of Somali. So we are, we know that there's a lot of trade going on. We are considering uh, Somali as we develop the corridor and they are free and they'll be free to join us uh, and to use the port of Lamu in whichever way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, really appreciate. Um, as well on the Q&A, because um, uh, in Durban, you have talking much about digitalization. I have a question as well for you uh, about um, basically, which are the real benefits of digitalization in terms of uh, revenue, in terms of uh, reducing the total transit time for a port like Durban? Do you have any insight to share with us to answer to that question, please, Moshe? Uh, can you come again with the question? I just want to understand that I, I because the question. On the Q&A, they, 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 uh, they referred about the fact that you have uh, talked many times about digitalization and uh, the use of new tools for developing your ports and your logistics activities. And uh, the question is, what are the real benefits of that space of digitalization at the port of Durban? And the second question is in terms of revenue, in terms of cutting the transit time or the dwell time, they, they would like to have maybe okay. much more about uh, yeah. what does really mean digitalization for a port like Durban? Look, for us, it means, for example, we've got uh, multiple users of the port and uh, terminal operators. If we get onto the single platform, we immediately taking out the opaqueness on the system where you do not know what is coming, when to expect it. The information will be there for quick decision making. We, we need, uh, most of from a port authority point of view, we need a single system that will give us a sense of what to expect and when. And that information we feel is going to be useful for the port users because they can then make decisions around how they should run their own operation based on that information. It will take out all the unknowns that are there uh, for people not knowing. Save them time, most of for COVID now. You do not want to have people passing papers because those are, are, are the contact uh, points where one to two men move from one person to the other. But if uh, everything else is online, you, you start taking out all the unnecessary issues. Whether you're talking to customs, it should be just one area where you get everybody to trade and be able 
in that way you you saving cost where you would have a guy running with a bike bringing a document as an example you don't have to do it well. you can do it from your office and also the fact that you cannot just send your vehicles when it is not expected in the port or the cargo is not ready for you to collect you bring it and then you burn hours on end in the queue so all of those wastes that you will find the waste of over deploying resources or waste of just queuing you will take those out and there will be a benefit for everyone uh, to know what to do for us it's important because we are surrounded by industries that are in auto manufacturing most of them are working on just in time and information is critical uh, from a planning and execution point of view that we all have relevant information at the right time thank you thank you very much thank you so much um i have another topic uh, which have to be uh, addressed actually on the q a is about maritime security we just have referred a couple of times on and um, as general secretary um, i would say colonel andre Cizou, maybe you uh, you can uh, you can uh, maybe uh, I would say, give us some information about what has been done, uh, especially uh, at the PAMESA level, uh, at the port management level, uh, to solve uh, maritime security issues uh, on the eastern part of, of your area, but as well now on the Mozambique, uh, because uh, we know that you we have deal as well on inland security. And uh, those people, uh, they know that, um, a port is a strategic asset, and uh, when you target a port, you, you can freeze uh, the economy and you can drop down the, uh, a local area. So it is, is PAMESA doing something dedicated to solve security issues, actually? In fact, uh, what had happened uh, during the time we had that piracy problem in the region, there were lots of capacity building exercises that went on, including training, local training and abroad. And uh, we got the support of all these uh, military forces that were in the region, the international naval forces, coast guards, that joined together to support most of the countries on the coast and uh, mobilizing resources from within also. And uh, I think so far, most of the ports are uh, compliance with the international ship and port facility security. And at the same time, in parallel to that, most of the countries also beef up their capacity to repel any aggression from uh, the scourge of the piracy that would have maybe potential to land ashore. So, so far, I think there's lots of satisfaction that the ports in the region, including the Eastern African and Southern African coast, are in compliance to the inter international security standards. Uh, I, I will, thank you very much, because you know you are you are a Mauritian citizen, so you are on an I island. Am I'm Seychelles. <laughs> ah, you are. I'm sorry, but that's the same. That's the same because I would say yeah, that yeah, you yeah. are on an yeah. island. We are and brothers. Sec and maritime security issues are. Are totally vital for you, you know, especially on the development of your uh, local uh, economy and national economy. Uh, Captain, fr from Madagascar point of view, um, do, do you have any, um, I would say, special um, uh, initiative to tackle uh, uh, maritime as well as maybe port management uh, security issues in a large island like Madagascar? Well, uh, in Madagascar, we have a uh, few issues in maritime security. If uh, we look, for example, in uh, uh, in terms of IUU fishing, uh, in terms of uh, uh, smuggling uh, by sea, uh, eat drugs or uh, uh, natural resources such as uh, uh, wooden um, uh, woods or something like that. Um, as uh, initiatives, uh, we uh, the government decided to to strengthen the, the the maritime capabilities uh, through uh, first of all uh, establishing a, a national uh, IFC. Uh, information fusion center uh, for the Madagascar 
uh, and uh, we uh, also contribute to the regional uh, efforts uh, to fight uh, uh, maritime insecurity uh, through uh, the hosting of the regional maritime uh, IFC, uh, which was developed under the uh, MAZE program, Maritime Security Program, run by the Indian Ocean Commission. I think it's a big, uh, uh, a, a big change and a big progress uh, in the region. Uh, I mean by that the Western Indian Ocean region uh, in having uh, uh, the re two regional centers. One is based in Madagascar uh, for the uh, IFC and the other one is based in Seychelles uh, for the, the operations. I think that uh, it is a new, uh, a new era in terms of uh, regional cooperation uh, to tackle and to, 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 to address maritime safety, but also uh, maritime security uh, issues uh, in the region. And I think if all the countries in the region are really supporting and uh, pushing this uh, uh, regional initiative, it will have for sure a very huge impact on port security management as well as maritime security uh, uh, in general in the, in the region. Uh, uh, as you know, we still facing a, a certain number of uh, regional uh, maritime security issues. Now, uh, I think this year, there is a new uh, threat uh, around uh, Mozambique uh, mm -hmm. through the, the, the development of uh, uh, the terrorism. Uh, this can be... Uh, uh, having an evolution toward the sea if uh, there is uh, no uh, uh, effort to, to really uh, uh, tackle it regionally and of course with uh, the collaboration with the international community. So um, I think that uh, for Madagascar, we are working very hard in strengthening our uh, capacity uh, to uh, um, to ensure maritime surveillance is uh, 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 for the maritime spaces and their or national jurisdiction. But uh, what I can say also is that uh, there is uh, in the last three four years there uh, there is a, a huge change uh, in the region uh, because of uh, regional effort in developing uh, a regional capacity through uh, the regional centers. Oh, that, that's really, uh, really impressive. I, I, I would say that you are really in advance and you try to anticipate uh, by putting, uh, I would say the right effort, uh, you know, on, on, the, on, such, uh, on such framework and such uh, abilities, you know, to tackle with security. And I'm really impressed by that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just juggling on the, with, the, with the remarks. And the, Maina, I have another one for you about the labs at corridors. Um, do, do you expect to, to, to deploy some, uh, what is called the tailor-made digital tools like a corridor single window to facilitate cross-border management of cargo and the smooth, the movement of import of export through three national uh, three countries. Is that in your plan as well, to have such uh, tools for supporting uh, uh, the reduce, the, I would say the cost of, the, the cut of the cost on, on the corridor? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ian. If I got you correctly, uh, you are asking about the movement uh, in between the the, 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 the the border from one country to the other country. Especially and, uh, in terms of interconnectivity of systems, because you know we, 
we have sometimes many single windows. I, I used to, to, to joke about the fact that it's cool to have one single windows, but when you have more than one single windows, it starts not to be a one single one. <laughs> yeah, we are, we, we are planning for that. And uh, maybe just to say what we have already done, like uh, in our border town in Moyale, we have already come up with what we are calling uh, the one-stop uh, border shop where maybe you have a one point where the, the, the clearance of uh, cargo and the clearance of wood is done once. And once it's done at that point, then uh, it's able to move to the other country. And, and better still is that uh, once we do it, for example, in Kenya, they don't have to do it on the other side of uh, Ethiopia because we already have officers from Ethiopia sitting in our country. And then on the other side, we have officers from Kenya sitting on uh, the Ethiopian side, eh? which makes then uh, the clearance of uh, either good or uh, uh, persons faster. And this is what we are aiming at. We are working very closely uh, with the, the, the two governments. So the next stop now again will be in our border with uh, Southern Sudan. Uh, if the resources allow again, we would have something like that. And uh, this is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I have the right information about the Colonel Caesar from Seychelles and not from Mauritius. I have another question for you, but it's a personal one. It's, it's from my perspective. I just would like to know, Colonel, what, what is your, your point of view about um, the, you know, the past COVID uh, uh, cruising industry and activities into the Indian Ocean? Because uh, we know that some countries like Seychelles as well um, decided to uh, be a little bit more severe, I would say, regarding uh, the development of the cruising industry and its uh, sometimes negative impact on environment and even on social activities on, on some islands. Uh, what is your point of view as, uh, I would say, uh, port manager of Seychelles as well as from Pameza? What do, what do you expect from, ship, from the cruising industry? It, it, it would recover as business as usual after the COVID or something will change uh, in a better way, I guess, I hope so, uh, for the port of the area. Oh, thank you. There's lots of thoughts about it. In fact, uh, there have been also some studies to see if we are deriving the right benefits from this industry. But at one point, we were working very hard, and it is a collaborative business to sort of develop the cruise industry as a collaborative business, whereby we don't compete when it comes to go to trade fairs. And Seychelles has got its stand in one corner, Mauritius or the corner, Madagascar, somewhere else. We are promoting the idea that uh, we promote a cruise as Cruise Africa. In fact, uh, Pamesa registered a brand a few years ago, which is called the Cruise Africa. The idea is to, to develop the initiative whereby when we go to the trade fairs in Europe, where our main markets are, we go under one roof. And when we, we meet the clients, we show them, the clients may opt to, to the mainland and also the islands. And in addition to that, to support also the development of cruise tourism that can fly inside to the landlink countries and catch the rail and board the ship in another uh, countries further down south or east, uh, depending on which uh, ports they decide to disembark and do a tour in the inland countries as well as the lakes. So it is a big initiative that we are pushing. Unfortunately, the COVID had come and we have not managed to realize that but uh, with the, after the pandemic, I believe it will continue, though it will take a little bit of time. But at least there's the good intention that all countries should work together with the tourism authorities, the private sectors, and the ports authorities to see that we derive benefit uh, uh, from this industry. And we should not also out, outprice our, our, our countries. But at the same time, we need to ensure that there's respect to the environment and sustain this industry that in return also sustain the environment. It should be an integrated development. We need to continuously work together, put our minds together to ensure that the industry flourish with benefits 
economical and social benefits to the to the continent and the islands. Thank you very much. Someone would like maybe to to in, to react to 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 what has been said by uh, by Colonel um, Ciso about the the cruising development in the forthcoming years in, into your area. I don't know. Maybe maybe uh, maybe a captain from uh, from Madagascar. I know that. Uh, Cruising industry is a little, really well developed in some specific places in Madagascar, but you have so many others which are not really well served by the, the cruising industry. Is that in your plan to develop or not, considering uh, what uh, Colonel Ciso said actually about the externality or the positive uh, effect and benefits of cruising on the on local population and the local environment? Uh, indeed, uh, uh, Madagascar, uh, Seychelles, and the other uh, uh, islands uh, uh, members of the Indian Ocean Commission are on the same boat in terms of uh, tourism development and specifically uh, the cruise uh, industry. And uh, I uh, fully agree with uh, what uh, Colonel Ciso uh, uh, elaborated uh, uh, before. Uh, as far as Madagascar is uh, concerned, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, uh, considering the cruising uh, industry as a part of uh, 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 an economic uh, pillar inside the maritime tourism. And uh, we, uh, with uh, the big uh, uh, cruise, uh, cruising uh, organizer, uh, organizers are uh, 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 working together to, to, to make the, the cruise ship uh, arriving uh, in uh, Madagascar, like for instance, the, the Costa Group, uh, MSC, uh, and uh, so on. Um, in some uh, area like, uh, for example, uh, Nusi Bay, Diego Suarez, uh, uh, Saint Marie, uh, Tamatav, uh, Tomasina, and uh, uh, Fort Dauphin. Those are uh, uh, places where uh, uh, are really um, uh, receiving. Uh, most of the time, the, the, the cruise, uh, cruise ships. And uh, we intend to uh, uh, more and more uh, develop our uh, port infrastructures to uh, be able to receive uh, and accommodate uh, the, 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 the uh, cruise, uh, cruise ships. But of course, it will uh, be uh, reactivated once again after the the the, the COVID nineteen, uh, yeah. we are uh, at the pre at present time already preparing uh, to to receive the the cruise ship uh, maybe around two thousand twenty two, but we are already preparing the the the. the the campaign of uh, the arrival of those uh, uh, cruise ships in uh, Madagascar. But of course, these vaccines, of course, uh, are uh, the key uh, because uh, uh, without uh, the vaccines, uh, it will be a little bit difficult to, to, to to be able uh, to, to receive safely uh, the, 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 the cruise, uh, cruise passengers, yes. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And Moshe, what is about um, uh, the position, I would say, the official position uh, of uh, a part of Durban as well as Transnet uh, considering um, I, may, I, I would maybe qualify that at the next area in which uh, cruising industry might enter after the COVID. Is that an official uh, position or to, to develop uh, 
um, dedicated services uh, based on the 100% safe uh, calling uh, and so on. Uh, do you have something to share with us about that uh, really specific uh, sector of activities uh, for port managers? Look, uh, like I said earlier, uh, we are busy preparing ourselves uh, for when the, 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 the COVID thing is over. In the port of Deben, there's a new cruise terminal that is under construction. It's going to be open this year in October. That is if there's no lockdown that will further disrupt the construction. So we're looking at going big with the cruise uh, terminal. Uh, Cape Town has got uh, a, a new cruise terminal. So, but all of those have not been active uh, since last year, March. The last cruise uh, that uh, moved in the South African waters was on the 23rd of March last year. So we haven't been active, but we are preparing, getting ourselves ready. We lining up with the other players in the hospitality industry to understand how we should be supporting it going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, 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 I just remind a couple of years ago in Cape Cod, we got a problem because of the scarcity of natural water, you know, for local population and agricultural business. and. Uh, we heard that, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I can remind maybe uh, that um, some cruising line have skipped uh, the, the call of uh, Cape Cod because they were not able to, uh, uh, you know, to have some fresh water. On. Am I right or not, or just dreaming about that? You're referring to, I'm not aware, you asking from South Africa perspective. Yes, because I, I, I just remind that maybe Colonel Ciso uh, would refresh my, my, my memory about that. But uh, I, I do believe that a couple of years ago, you know, we got some problem because we have a drought in, the, in, in Cape Cod area and uh, Cape, um, not Cape Cod, Cape Town, sorry, Cape Town area. Oh, Cape Town. And, okay. uh, and some shipping, uh, some cruising shipping lines have been able to have been uh, invited to skip the the schedule because of the scarcity of uh, natural water available in the area. Am I right or not? There was a time when Cape Town indeed was facing water challenges, but uh, what South African community did was amazing. Uh, working with the gift of the givers. We shipped water from various destinations. I know in Deben, we had uh, more than 10 containers uh, of bottled water that was sent to Cape Town, but it, it was an issue that was just specific over that short period of time. Otherwise, we haven't uh, had the problems. We have since also started uh, doing the desalination in the port of Cape Town, where we're freeing the use of fresh water and say facilities such as dry dock should be using water that has been desalinated. And then we, we were sparing fresh water for human consumption. We also had made the same call on the ships because the ships have got facility to desalinate water and say, please let, let's then be sparing in terms of using water. That's what we're doing right now, but there's no problem with water at all now. Okay, thank you very much, Moshe, thank you. Um, Uda, if I'm not wrong, we are a couple of minutes ahead of uh, concluding. So if you don't mind, I, I just would like to give the floor to each of, of you for maybe uh, if you have uh, just a final statement to, to share with us in a couple of minutes. And uh, I would use the, you know, um, as we said at the beginning, maybe I would start with Pameza to, to have your concluding remarks. And after that, I, I would go to South Africa and uh, to Lapset and finally to Madagascar. Uh, of course, thank, uh, I, I would like just mention that I would thank all of you for being part of that uh, first English uh, webinar for, for e-conference. And uh, Colonel Ciso, if you have two minutes to conclude about uh, your vision, you know, of the Eastern and Southern port development in the, I would say the next 10 years. You have only two minutes for that, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you so much, Jan. Uh, in fact, uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, if you permit, that uh, PAMESA is working on a very important project. We wanted to realize it last year, uh, so that uh, unfortunately with the COVID we could not. We wanted to mobilize all the exporters in the PAMESA region and importers 
the phytosanitary authorities, the regulators, the ports authorities to come together into one, one, uh, one big room whereby everybody will express their challenges, show the opportunities to others, and the, the challenges that concerns the regulatory authorities, the phytosanitary authorities, so that they can all understand the importance of each and every partners into the, the value, chain analysis, uh, value chain of the African development to discuss, make recommendation, and take it to the appropriate authorities if there's amendment to do with laws, regulations, whatever, to permit trading across the border to flow effectively. In fact, we wanted to work with the Chamber of Commerce and uh, so that everybody is on board when it comes to uh, output and chart the way forward for Africa to be able to trade amongst itself. And uh, the next one was, one, we, we know that in the Horn of Africa, especially the, our PAMISA members had been going through many bad years. We wanted to mobilize them and bring them together in one area, in one big room with financial institutions from the continent that could identify projects to support development of projects that would in return bring economic development, economic and social development, I mean, to the region of the Horn of Africa. And the Development Bank of South Africa is a partner of PAMESA and they are ready to help us spearhead this initiative to ensure that gradually by sector, PAMESA achieve the results that it wants to see when it comes to stronger collaboration instead of competition amongst our ports in the region. So that our mission finally will bring economic and social development when it comes to the areas of our mandate. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. Congratulations, Colonel Sizu, for supporting such initiative. Uh, I would really, really, really uh, interested in uh, following your 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 job about that, you know, and uh, do not hesitate if I uh, personally be able to uh, uh, add a piece of value into that initiative. Uh, it would be my pleasure to collaborate along with you and the, all the PAMESA port management and authorities. It would we be- We will invite you. We will invite you. Thank it, you. It would be a great <laughs> pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Moshe, if you have a couple of words to conclude about uh, the vision of South Africa and uh, particularly the, the port of Durban in, in really a few short uh, uh, statements, please. Thank you. We, we just want to tell the participants that the port of Durban is gearing itself to be a port that is free of congestion. We want to create capacity ahead of demand and our vision really is to unlock the potential that lies within the region because we know there are so many who are dependent on us and we're doing that by working with everyone private sector institution of higher learning shippers shipping line tracking association employees and everybody so Deben is the port to be watched in the coming 12 years we've got big things to come and in doing that we also are setting up terminals that are going to be rail friendly because it is our belief that uh, we have to make the terminals to be more accommodative towards uh, servicing the country by using rail. And we hope that is going to give us the desired outcomes. Uh, we are going to be the hub uh, in this part of the world and unlock potential for others, uh, which will enable the cabotage and few other interventions to take root. Thank you very much. And doing that, we're still going to be a green port. We do not want to, to, to bypass that. We are focusing on the expansion that is environmentally sensitive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moshe. I remind that, you know, more than a decade ago, I was in Durban and the, your general manager at that time explained why Durban is the gateway of Africa. And in 2021, I still believe that Durban is still the gateway for Africa. Thank you so much for that. And, and Maina, same exercise, a couple of words to conclude about the lab set before visiting you and uh, driving up to South Sudan uh, with you to, to discover by myself how beautiful is the lab set corridors. Please. Yeah, and you are very welcome to this country. <laughs> but uh, when you come, actually, we'll drive you that, that along the corridor. Yes, allow me once again to say that um, this is a project which is geared towards uh, 
actually opening the northern Kenya part of this country and again joining it with Somari, opening the southern part of uh, Ethiopia and also the southern part of uh, uh, southern Sudan. But more than that, as I put it earlier, our dream is to link the eastern part of this, country, uh, this continent with the western part of this continent. And we are looking forward for this day when uh, goods will be transported from um, uh, uh, the eastern part of uh, this continent, that is uh, Asia and the rest of that part, eh? they'll come to Lamu. The, the containers will be picked by an SGR. And then within a day or two, they'll be at Douala. And then from Douala, they can be again taken to the other part of uh, this world. That's our dream. And we are looking forward uh, to see that dream in the near future. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Maina. I would be in the first container for sure for doing that trip. That would be my journey. That would be my journey. Thank you so me, much. Me, really me appreciate too. It. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Capitaine, let's go, let's move to, to, to Madagascar for the concluding words. And because Uda is just watching me, and I know that we are perfectly on time. So, Capitaine, s'il vous plaît, just a, a couple of words from your amazing island from Madagascar, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, allow me to thank the organizer of this uh, forum. Uh, and uh, um, what I can uh, say is that uh, although Madagascar is a little bit behind in terms of uh, port development, uh, Madagascar is actually engaging itself uh, in uh, laying the foundation for uh, port development through a new uh, national uh, maritime transport policy, uh, development of a national master plan for ports. And uh, we are really uh, 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 working hard to uh, reach the, the, the level of the countries in the region. Uh, secondly, I would like to, to, to say that uh, regional uh, cooperation is very important in terms of uh, ports uh, activities uh, and uh, let's not make competition, but let's work on complementarity. Uh, so that is uh, what uh, I uh, can say. Uh, third, but not uh, but not least, it is also important for the region to work together in the areas of maritime safety and security, which is uh, one of the pillar for port uh, and trade development in the region. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Captain. Thank you so much. Uda, uh, I would like just to thank uh, all uh, our panelists for sharing uh, such insights about, uh, you know, development of Eastern and Southern. It has been the first for us, and I do believe that we have to, to do it again and again, because we have so many other hot topics to tackle and to deal with. Uh, thank you very much, E-Conference. Um, I do believe that we have a meeting in two weeks for concluding our French set uh, by talking about corridors, and uh, mm -hmm. I would share. I'm, I would be sure that I would drop again on, on on the top of the list the fact that sometimes, in in a way, uh, eastern and western part of uh, of Africa will be connected to uh, amazing corridors. So thank you so much again for all the the audience for your questions and. Uh, Uda, the floor is yours for conclusion uh, three minutes after the deadline, but I, I guess it's, no it's, it's all right. Thank you so much. Thank you for all. Thank you, Jan, for your brilliant moderation. I thank all the panelists for the quality of the debate and the fruitful exchanges. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank all participants uh, for having followed us. And finally, I thank our partners who support us throughout this series of web conference Africa Ports Forum Live. I will be meeting you in two weeks time for a new edition, which will focus on corridors and regional integration. Until then, I wish you a good day and see you soon.
Thank you very much. Thank you.